see anything in this photograph that may injure or kill you? Yes. Yeah. Jeff, what would that be? If a tree falls on me, I don't think it would be good. If a tree falls on you, it probably would not be good. Cindy? A lot of snow falling on you. A lot of snow falling on you, that's a great answer. Anybody else? What do you see there that may injure or kill you? Maurice? The cold. The cold. Tell me more about the cold, Maurice. Well, how, would that, how would that injure or kill us? Hypothermia, um, frostbite, I mean, just se several. I'm allergic to cold, so. <laughs> frostbite. That's exactly what I was looking for, Maurice. And how, how can we mitigate that cold from killing us? How can we mitigate that cold? Prepare. Prepare. How would we prepare, Deborah? That was great answer. It's what I wanted. How we dress. How, how we you, dress. Um, being aware of the temperature so that you make sure your body is adjusting slowly. Absolutely. We're doing that. Maurice, you had something else? Uh, I, I think people don't think about this, and this may be off, but I'm thinking hydration. Hydration. Oh. Absolutely. Mm. Hydration is one of the things that happens in the cold. And some of us know about the cold. Hydration. Thank you. And so other than that mitigation, let's think about this. When we go out, we need to prepare. And we need to prepare for these things that can injure or kill us. But now let me ask you this. Do you know when these things are always going to happen? For an example, any event. Do you know when lightning is going to strike? Do you know the time and the place that lightning is going to strike? No. We don't. Because if we knew the time and the place that lightning was going to strike, where would we be? Somewhere else. Somewhere else. <laughs> Jeff, we would be somewhere else. Just like if we knew the time, the place, and the location, and the victim selection for a bad guy, we wouldn't be there either, would we? No. So what are some ways that we can mitigate being a victim of violence? What are some ways we can mitigate that? Awareness. Awareness. That's what I was looking for, Jeff. That's one of the things. How else? Stay in bed. <laughs> Stay in bed. Stay, Stay home. <laughs> I like that, Jim. Cindy? Do your homework and assess the risk. Assess the risk, Cindy. Absolutely. We want to assess the risk. We would not be there. But let's think about this. Who are these people that we might meet when we're on a listing? That looks like some mild-mannered gentleman from 1980, doesn't it? 1980s glasses. Looks like a nice guy, doesn't he? Sure. He does. He looks like a nice guy. Does he not look like every single one of the people-ish that, that we deal with? <laughs> Absolutely. So who are these people that attack? Who are they? Well, let's get into the facts. We're going to cover just the facts. I would like to introduce you to James Mitchell de Bartolaben. You've probably never heard of James Mitchell de Bartolaben. And that's okay, because I'm going to share with you who he was. He was the most heinous serial killer in the United States of America on an 18-year killing spree. That's a long time, isn't it? He is believed to have committed every known felony when he was arrested. He was a rapist, he was a counterfeiter, he was a bad guy. Every known felony. That's a lot, isn't it, Jeff? It is. It's a lot. He disguised himself as a police officer. That's a lot. Think about that when you get pulled over. If you've ever been speeding, and you get pulled over, ladies, on a dark and stormy night. That could be detrimental to you. I want you to look at that quote. Unmatched anywhere for its... Excuse me. He had a death kit when he disguised himself as a police officer also. Handcuffs, choker, some stuff so graphic that I will not even get into it. Now, if you write this person's name down and you want to do your homework on him, I encourage you not to get into the dark stuff. Please don't get into dark stuff. I... The world of violence is the world that I live in, and I nearly vomited. I was getting nauseous reading what he did to other human beings. So please do not get into the dark stuff. So think about that, ladies, when you pull over sometime. 
by a police officer. Additionally, he was believed to have gone after real estate agents. He was suspected of a string of murders of real estate agents. Does that, does that scare anyone in here? Tell me. What he did? It did. Unmatched anywhere for its, notice its, sadism and scope and his success in eluding detection. I'm going to put this into more context for you. I'm going to give you some names of individuals that you have heard of, like Ted Bundy, Jeffrey Dahmer, and John Wayne Gacy. Their depredations were amateur compared to what he did. Now let's think about this. Ted Bundy raped and murdered women, and then he raped them after they were dead. That's really sick. Jeffrey Dahmer raped teenage boys and murdered them, and then he ate them. And John Wayne Gacy raped little boys and murdered them and buried them under his house. And this guy was even worse than them. Think about that. This is very graphic. I want to help you understand the gravity of what you're going into. These people didn't even know who this person was that they were dealing with. He had audio tapes, audio tapes of him torturing his wives and his victims. Thousands of photographs were found in his storage unit. He operated in 44 different states. Men, do not think that you're immune from this because men and women were both his victims. He was a psychopathic sexual sadist. That's a horrific thing for any of us. But, on January 26, 2011, he got what was coming to him in North Carolina. He died of a horrible death of pneumonia. So that's pretty good for all of us who are out here in this world continuing to live our lives and take care of our families. Now don't think, don't think that it can't happen to you. Because in everyday encounters, this one week, three different agents were, were victims of violence. One of them was found strangled to death in a burning, vacant home, and another one was shot to death in a vacant home. Now what does that tell us about vacant homes? It's like risky. It's risky. Cindy, why is it so risky? It's vacant and nobody's around. It's called time and opportunity. Time and opportunity. Maurice? And I think, I think on vacant houses, um, we are, our defense mechanism goes down. It's like nobody's in there, so I just march on in there and do my thing and get out of there. Mm. Is, do you think that's, what, do you, what does everybody think about that for an attitude? of vacant homes. I mean, that's right, but that's what we do. Who, who, does, who does anybody expect to be in there? It's vacant. Nobody. It's vacant. So who's coming and looking to see who's in that home? Following up. Anyone? Unless you've been missing for a certain amount of time, no one's looking for you. Time and opportunity. And then the last person was robbed at gunpoint in an apartment building. So it can happen anywhere. So some of you may be wondering, well, who is this Will Parker guy? Mm -hmm. Well, my name is Will Parker. And I had the distinct pleasure of serving our nation for more than 25 years in the military. Thank you. I'm a force science analyst, mainly for police, op for police officers to go get certified to analyze uh, defensive situations and so forth, to recognize these things from happening. Some of, the, some of the other students asked, well, how did I get into this? How did I get into teaching real estate when I'm a self-defense person? And I think it was Cindy that asked me. Well, years ago, I used to date a realtor for four years. And one day she said, hey, there's a homeless person in one of my listings. Will you please come out with me? And I carried a firearm with me and I went out there. There was, there was no issues. But then I was thinking, well, this is pretty crazy. This, this attractive woman is out here showing people homes. And then I, sir, we didn't stay together. And I 
I served in the military, I retired, I got in the self-defense industry, and then I thought back of my time uh, dating this lady who I cared about a great deal, and I thought about all of us in here, and how you may be a victim of violence, and how you need good quality education and training to not be a victim of violence. Because at the end of the day, what's, what's our goal at the end of the day? Go home. Go home safely to our families. So I'd like to welcome you to the Not a Victim Every Day. Now, here's, here's a little intel on this picture. Where this picture was taken, my wife took this picture and she grew up right there. Wow. Right there, every summer, for her, for her whole childhood, until she was an adult and left home. That was her view every morning when she woke up. So you're probably wondering, what are we going to cover today? Well, I'm glad that you asked, because we are going to talk about avoidance, planning, preparation, awareness. We're going to get into the color codes of awareness, and mental exercises. This is what we are going to cover. But why is this so important? Why? I'll tell you. Because if you have a plan, if you're aware, and you've gone through these scenarios in your mind, you can, you can see yourself going through it and surviving and being successful. And really, you want to avoid it to begin with. So we also want to recognize what may happen. Did you know that your body cannot go where your mind has never been before without conscious thought? Maurice does. Thank you, Maurice. So we should take this into account and use it. Just like, just like teaching last night. I was going through this class, seeing myself being successful, visualizing, thinking of questions that will be asked seeing myself successful. So this is what we are going to cover. What we are going to cover. So like I said, at the end of every day, we want to get home safely to our families. We have to take personal responsibility for ourselves. And who else are we trying to take care of when we're out showing properties? Who else are we trying to take care of? Our clients. Our clients. Now, are we always with our clients? No. What about when we're not working? Our family. We owe it to our family to take care of them as well. Now some of you men in here may be thinking, I can take care of my wife. Well, what about when you're not with, your wife is not with you? Who's taking care of her? Who's taking care of her? And what if, ladies, when you say, my husband will take care of me. He'll take care of me. What happens when he's not there or if Something happens to him. Who's going to take care of him when he's down? And who else are we concerned about? Our children. Our children. We owe it to our posterity to take care of them as well. We have to take personal responsibility. Don't think that the cavalry is going to come and save you. Now, many of us live out west, and we have large counties, don't we? Large counties. So here's a question for you. Who lives outside of incorporated city limits? And what I mean by that is who does not have a police department available to come and help them? Okay? Well. No, no, a police department, not the sheriff's yeah. police department. Okay? So that's us. I want you to know that I, that I talk to a lot of police officers and the patrol commanders have told me where I live that they've told the 911 operator, tell them we're not coming. I want you to know what that sounds like. I want everybody to close your eyes, take a little journey with me, pretend that this is you. You're home alone with your newborn baby. There's a violent pounding at your door. You grab your cell phone and your baby and you retreat to the bedroom and you call 911. You're on the phone with 911. About one minute into the call, your front door gives way. Your voice elevates then of course he can find you a little bit faster. He starts pounding on your door. And in a very chilling voice, you tell the 911 operator, he's here. 
At one minute and 15 seconds into this call, your bedroom door gives way. You're shouting, who are you? Why are you doing this? I don't know you. A few seconds later, you're shrilling, oh God, oh God, as you're watching him cave your baby's head. And at one minute and 42 seconds into this call, you succumb to the same thing that your baby did. You can open up your eyes. I heard that 911 call five and a half years ago. And I still have a hard time not crying today, listening to that woman and her baby get murdered on the phone. It was horrific. It was horrific. It doesn't take very long for someone to, to hurt you. So I encourage you, please pay attention. Be prepared, be aware, plan. Plan these things out. See yourself leaving. I know it was pretty hard, wasn't it? Cheers my eyes. It's hard to listen to that. So I would like to invite one of my mentors to come in and talk to you and introduce personal and home protection plan. At its most basic level, a personal and home protection plan is designed to keep us physically, legally, financially and morally safe. Now it's easy to understand what I mean by keeping ourselves physically safe, but what do I mean by legally, financially, and morally safe? Well, here's the reality. If we ever find ourselves in a situation where we're required to use force or even deadly force to protect ourselves or our families, we're not suddenly going to get a free pass from the police, the prosecutor, the media, or even our friends and family. Everything we did is going to be second guessed. Even if we did everything right, we'll certainly be investigated by the police, and if there's any question at all about whether we broke the rules for using force or deadly force, we might find ourselves charged with a crime. Even a simple investigation by the police might cost us $10,000 in legal fees, while a full-blown case could cost us several hundred thousand dollars or more. In addition to those legal and financial injuries, we might also have to deal with moral or emotional injuries as well. If the police, the media, or even our friends, family, or employer believed we put ourselves in a situation that could have been avoided, we might find ourselves dealing with an incredibly painful emotional fallout. Because of those four injuries that can occur during any violent encounter, the ultimate goal of a personal and home protection plan must be to avoid violent encounters in the first place by developing an acute awareness of our surroundings and by making intelligent decisions about our actions, behavior, and precautions. five injuries that we may sustain. Michael talked about four, and I like to talk about five of them. Physical. A lot of people in the West, and a lot of agents, do what? In accordance with NAR, a lot of agents carry self-defense. Mm -hmm. Carry self-defense with them. But what do a lot of people think when they carry? They're, nothing's gonna happen to them. Mm -hmm. Here's the worries. In fact, not only do, we, do, do I feel that nothing's going to happen to me, I feel that I'm even bad, bigger and badder now that I have my weapon on me with, than without. Maurice, I like that. A lot of people think that, which means they don't think about these three words. You might die. You might die. Mm -hmm. And that, that happens a lot. So physical, moral, I will tell you that we have been programmed, we have been programmed to be adversely affected by violence. There's a reason why 22 veterans kill themselves every single day. Be not just because we lived a jacked up life in the military, but because we saw things and we did things that humans are not supposed to see. So expect yourself to be adversely affected by that. Third, socially. The mark of Cain. Think about this. Some people may think that you should never, ever use any level of force against another human being. Now some of our family members may think that as well. Makes Thanksgiving dinner a little bit awkward now, doesn't it? 
there was a police officer involved in a deadly force encounter. It wasn't his family. Who do you think told him who he needed in his life he was no longer welcome? Who do you think that would be? Kids. Wasn't his family. Wasn't his family. Church. His pastor. Jeff, thank you. His pastor told him he was no longer welcome to come to church anymore. Social jeopardy is a thing. And if you're using a level of force against somebody and you harm them, what else might we expect to happen? Legal jeopardy. Legal jeopardy. You can be 100% innocent of doing anything wrong, but the county attorney, prosecutor, may say, you know what? I don't think that that person should have done that, and they punish you by the process. And if they punish you by the process, what other jeopardy does that bring into play? Financial jeopardy. It's incredibly expensive. So we need to know how to play the game, the rules to the game, to play it properly, to be less expected to be involved in that encounter. So please, please, getting out of there is your number one rule, which brings us right into why is conflict avoidance so important? It's so important because if you weren't there, it can't happen to you. If, if you are there, you have a greater than 0% chance of something happening to you. And you need to be prepared to live with those results. And I ask you, what motivates you? What motivates you to educate and train yourself to not be a victim of violence? I submit to you, it's, what do you love? What do you love? You should probably write these things down. I can tell you my list. My list is me. Me. It's always me first. Because if, if I'm gone, I cannot protect my wife. I cannot protect my daughter. I cannot protect my three grandchildren. And even my son-in-law is on that list. He's a good man. My daughter loves him. He's the father of my grandchildren. Okay? Make a list. Because you need to be prepared ahead of time for this. So please, write it down. Write it down. My mentor, Dr. William April, he was, a, uh, he was a mental health professional, and he talked to a lot of really horrific people. And he said they don't think like us. And he shared this quote, your consent and understanding are not required for someone to take your life, kill your loved ones, and destroy all you hold dear, because they don't think like us. So conflict avoidance, it's incredibly important. Is it worth dying? Is it worth going to prison for the rest of your life? Is it worth taking the life of another individual? You need to think about these things. If the answer is yes, then you're prepared to live with the results. You're prepared for that. If not, then find someplace else to be. You don't want to be there. Remove yourself from the situation. If you were forced to use a level of force against them, that's fine. But we have to stay within the rules of engagement. We have to follow the rules. Do all we can to get out of that situation. Now earlier I talked about you might you might die. Does anybody know is anybody up on their Latin? If if you're not, that's okay. Remember your mortality. Remember, it's important to remember this. If we avoid the situation, we can escape the situation, or we defend the situation. These three things, they all have one thing in common. One thing in common. And aside from our children, what is the most precious, irreplaceable resource on this earth? Time. time. These all have time in common. So please keep that in mind. We don't have a time machine at all. That's a time machine in the background of the witch. We don't have a witch in our back pocket either. Now you see Sarah on your left. Sarah's looking down at her phone. What else does she see? Nothing. Nothing. Thank you, Cindy. Nothing. Why? Because our attention can only be held by one thing. 
We, we start to lose our, our, our various senses. And Sarah on the right, her head is up, but she's looking straight ahead. Who here rides a motorcycle other than me? Am I the only motorcycle rider? Mm -hmm. I'm not okay. crazy. Too. Okay. So, Cindy, thank you for sharing that. And when we're riding on motorcycles, what is everybody out, everybody else out there trying to do? Avoid us. They're trying to kill us, right? <laughs> They're trying to kill us. They're trying to kill us. They are. So our head is always on a swivel. Swivel. Thank you, Cindy. Our head is always on a swivel because what we don't, what we don't see, can and is more than willing to kill us. Now, some people say, "Well, I can multitask." Let's put this into perspective right now. Let's, let's, let's squash that bug right now. How do I know that we can't multitask? I'll give you an example. Our attention can only be on one thing at a time. So I want you to think about this. I want you to think about writing a really, really important email and you're on a really important phone call at the same time. Do you think, who in here thinks they could do that successfully? Anybody? Because I'll put my hand down right now. I can't do it. Oh, did I see your hand up, Peggy Ann? You did. Sorry. <laughs> I would love to see that. Okay. If you can, you are high five. That's, that's what happens to us. We can't. Only one thing can have our attention at one time. This was proven in the Four Science Institute. I shared with you as a Four Science Analyst. But we see that Sarah is only looking straight ahead. But how do we know what's going on behind us in that blind spot? How do we see what's going on behind us? How do we see that? How do we see it? How do we see it, Jack? Mm -hmm. Say again? Peripheral. Oh, I can see, I can see out to here. Okay. Yeah. Right? Right? Well, I'm, I'm here now. I can see this. How can I see back there, though? Turn your head and look! Turn your head and look! <laughs> But, but Will, I, I, I might offend somebody behind me. Who cares? Okay. Nobody has a right to not be offended. <clears throat> Nobody. So turn your head and look. Another thing, I had the privilege of being a student of Mr. Dennis Tuller. Has anybody heard the name Tuller before? The Tuller Jeff? Drill. The Tuller Drill, yeah. the Tuller Principle. Absolutely. So Dennis was on the range one day. And one of his officers asked, Lieutenant, how close is too close with an edged or a contact weapon? And Dennis, being the smart guy he was and the teacher that he was, he said, you know what? I don't know. Let's find out. So he had his officers all take their turn, draw and fire two accurate shots. And the average time for that was 1.5 seconds. And then Dennis said, Let's see how far the average person can travel in 1.5 seconds. Thank you, Carol. 1.5 seconds. That average distance was 21 feet. Now, there's a, there's a lot of information in there. But I want you, before, before I get into the, the, that video, I want you to think about this. I want you to know, know this. It was a draw. Both individuals subsequently died of their injuries, the police officer and the attacker, both. Under those, under that situation, the context of that, both subsequently died. So I want you to, everybody get out your phones, I want you to take a picture of the next screen, and I want you to go and watch this video. It's 19 minutes long, and Dennis explains in detail the Tuller Principle. And when you're done, please set your phones down. Okay? So I would... Oh, did you, did you get it, David? No, I had okay. my phone off. Yeah, it okay, I'll, I'll leave it up there for you. And I would, I would like three volunteers because I would like to do an activity. Peggy Ann, thank you. Can I get two other volunteers? Jim and Jeff, sure. thank you. Jim, I would like you, so Peggy Ann, if you would stand <coughs> right here. And you've got the picture now, David? Yes. Thank you. Super. So we're going to have an activity. And, and Jim, if you will stand right here. 
And just for the moment, we're going to give you a, a, a spot right here, out of the way, and I'm going to use you in just a minute. So I want you to understand what this really means. So if, if Jim were an attacker that had a knife, and Peggy Ann is Peggy Ann, so you, Jim, you get to be an attacker, you don't need to be Jim right now. Do you guys see, in the context of this room, this is the situation, is Jim an immediate deadly force threat with a knife in his hand, you can even kind of pretend you have a knife in your hand, to Peggy Ann? Yes. Will you share why you think that is? Maybe, maybe even Peggy Ann is armed with a noisemaker that shoots, it's hot flashy. He can throw that knife. Mm, he's not going to throw it. Oh, he's not going to throw it? Mm -hmm. He could probably get to her before she could get away. Okay. How would she get away, Kathy? I like that answer. How would she head out that door? Okay, so you think he is an immediate deadly force threat? If he's got a knife in his hand, okay. I would think Is there right. anybody that disagrees? With Kathy, it's okay to disagree. Cindy, you disagree. I think Peggy Ann could make it to the door. And out the door. And out the door. Okay, so Jim, all you have to do when I say go, Peggy Ann's going to move, and you just have to touch her. Touch her appropriately. Thank you. Okay? Before Peggy Ann gets out the door. You guys ready? Go! Oh, he made it. She made it. Okay? Yeah. All right? What? How close, how close was he? Very close. close. If he, if he wouldn't, you can close the door, Jim. Thank you. And if you'll go back there, because we're going to have Jeff come back. Thank uh, you, Peggy Ann. You can done. sit back there. Oh, how is it been since you've run that fast, Jim? <laughs> okay. I do have a grandson, so yes, I All right? So, Jeff, if you'll go to the same spot. So, we had a young lady. And now we have a young man. Did I, see some, did I see a hand up over here? What if the door was locked? What if the door was locked? <gasps> Absolutely. <laughs> She's got to get the door unlocked somehow. You think she would have made it? No. What if, what if Peggy Ann would have not hit this, hit the bar, and just pushed on the door? Oh, it did break open because the door gives way. That would have been even more difficult for her. Was that easy, Peggy Ann? Yes. It was easy? Well, I pushed on the... I mean, getting getting away. But well, did she really get away? my heart was pumping pretty damn hard. All right. Are you guys both ready? We're going to do the same thing again. Okay. Do you need any, any coaching? You know what you're doing? I just want me to leave. I want you to try to get out. Maurice has a question. Oh, I'm sorry, Maurice. You know, it's funny, Will. Um, she, she, got, she, she, she got away, but uh, I never imagined that he would be able to close on her as fast as... Mm -hmm. as well, well and, and he is twice the distance from her. Yeah. And it was like, man, he was he was on the both of them. I'll, I'll, get to, I'll get to both of you or all three of you. The only thing about this though, do you think Jim would have caught her in about four steps down the hallway? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. She didn't get to close the door and lock it. <clears throat> so do you think that Jim was an immediate deadly force threat to Peggy Ann with a knife? Yes. 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 Now let's see, we'll see in just a moment. First, we're going to answer these questions. Jim, I think you had your hand up first. Yes, thank you. It, it was, it, we knew what was going to happen here. You, you told us what, what to do. So I doubt, I would, if I were the attacker, I would know what I'm about to do. She would not, or he would mm -hmm. not know mm -hmm. what I'm She'd have to wait to for you to move. That's right. Versus mm -hmm. just go. Which That's time. a great point. Costs you time. Mm -hmm. We talked about time. Thank you. That was exactly what I was going to say, okay. that she was prepared to run at the same time he was moving, but in a real situation, she wouldn't know what he was doing until he made a move and her brain kicked in, mm -hmm. oh, he's coming after me. Mm -hmm. And that would have delayed her probably just enough she wouldn't have gotten out the door. Absolutely, Deborah. Well, even he had a barrier between. A little bit. Her, a little bit of a barrier. He actually... Didn't have a straight line. He had to go around a little bit, which cost him time, but he had a little more time to get out. Certainly did cost him a little bit. So, Jeff, are you ready? Sure. Oh. I was about to say. Oh. 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 You right? You guys okay? Oh. Oh, yeah. Nobody got hurt, right? Yeah. Okay. But you caught him, didn't you? 
Well, I, I did eventually, yes. Legs. Good, don't I got my I got my boots like on. I don't normally wear my boots. Not bad with boots. Not bad with boots. So is that was that challenging? Was that an eye opener? What was that an eye opener for? It's a, it is an eye opener. You'll hear many people say that. So here's here's something to help understand how for that to not happen to you. Hopefully, don't look like a victim. How do we not look like a victim? Yeah. Keep your head up, be attention, be in condition yellow instead of condition white. Are you going to steal my thunder, Jeff? <laughs> that, was what I, that was great answers. Great answers because that's what we're trying to do. So we want to avoid the situation entirely if possible. And you ladies get this. How many of you ladies carry yourself with your head up, erect, walking like you know where you're going? Um, even this isn't, this isn't even quick. Yeah. But do I look confident? I certainly do. I, or I can walk like I was in the Marine Corps, right? I walk like this. And I'm looking around, where I'm going, I know what's around me. I'd be turning my head and looking also while I'm moving. Because when we look at people, when we look at them, we're saying, I see you. We look, at pe we look people in the face. How many times are you walking down the street and you go past somebody on the sidewalk, and they're doing, they're doing this. They don't want to look at you. Now, I will tell you, there are certain places that you go, and you know those places because you don't belong there. It's not your place, and you know it's... They, they know everybody that lives in their community. You don't look them in the face. Another place you look is here, on the belt line. Why do you look on the belt line? Weapons, because humans carry their weapons here. This is where we carry our weapons. Okay? We could take evasive action. What might these evasion actions look like? Well, one, maybe we could move a little bit faster. Maybe we walk a little bit slower. Maybe we walk into a place of business. We can do these things to help us avoid and maybe even recognize that someone's actually following us. These are some things that we can do to us. Tammy, you're, you're, you're one of the most petite people in this room. Do you think you can take this guy right here? Is he easy? That the context of it is in this photo. This is the context. Do you think you can take him? Do you think you can take his phone, take his shoes, and be gone? Why not? What I could do, some of the things that you were talking about, being alert. No, but you're the attacker. Oh, I'm the attacker? <laughs> you, think, you think you can take that guy? Yeah. Uh, he's not paying attention. He's not paying attention. And that's the moral of the story. He's not paying attention. So what should we all do when we're out in public? We should pay attention. It's not the odds of it happening to us. It's what are the stakes involved in this? And the stakes are what? What are the stakes? Life or death. Life or death. Ah. Now, Maurice, the, stakes are high. the stakes are high. Now someone, you may be saying, you know what? I'm willing to give my life for my family. That's the easy part. That's the easy part. What might be a little bit more difficult? Protecting your family, and if you're if you're unable to, for whatever reason, are you protecting your family? No, no you're not. Here's another thing to think about. What if, what if you're so badly injured, maybe it's your eyesight, you're permanently disfigured, you lost arms, you're a paraplegic. Now let's be real. How many of my brothers and sisters were maimed in combat and their spouses were not there for me? What about that? If you're not there to protect your family because you didn't have the knowledge, skills, and abilities to protect them, are you protecting them anymore? Yeah. So men, think about this. Think about something actually happens to you. You're out of the fight. What are they going to do to your wife and to your daughters? That's horrific. And they'll even do it to your sons. So please, 
please take safety seriously. If you're, if you're going to be a defender in some way, whether it's non-lethal all the way up to lethal, please be proficient, knowledge, skills, and abilities to do so. Please do that. It's not a game, but we can make a game of situational awareness. We are looking for bad guys. Who are we also looking for? Our allies. Who can help us in this? Look for those good people. They might inject themselves. They might choose not to. They might inject themselves. Watch their hands and their eyes. Humans kill humans with their hands or with tools that they put in their hands. Watch their eyes. Where are they looking? Maybe they're looking at your chin. Maybe they're going to punch you right on that button. Or maybe they're looking where they're going to go. Maybe they're looking around to see if anybody else sees what's about to happen. That's maybe what they're looking for. The criminals. From the criminal perspective, they're looking for people in condition white. I know you don't know what white is yet. Don't steal my thunder. We're going to get there. <laughs> And also take the time to monitor yourself. Am I paying attention to what's going on around me? Am I doing the things that I need to do? Am I looking around? Am I maybe carrying a firearm and adjusting things and showing people that I'm carrying a gun in some way? Maybe running across the road holding my gun or something like that. Whatever it is. Am I doing those things? Hopefully not. Hopefully not. So monitor yourself. Also, my, one of my mentors, Mr. Tom Gibbons, said that we can always ask ourselves these three questions. Where am I? Who is around me? And what are they doing? And those answer these three questions. What is going on around me? What's my environment? And can I get out? Now, if those doors didn't say emergency alarm only, I would have walked out those doors yesterday because I asked, will the alarm really go off? Because I was going to open those doors and find out where that courtyard goes to. Because if that goes out into a courtyard that doesn't have an escape route, it, it's not an emergency exit, is it? It's not. I don't want to set off the alarm and we shut everything down here. But I want to know that. I want to know the way out. When I got in the hotel, I walked down to the emergency exit, and I walked down the stairs, and I walked out the door. I encourage you to do that. And I encourage you to park your, your vehicle near that emergency exit that you may go out. So that if something happens, you get to your, your, your vehicle and escape. If, if something happens, you're safe. Cindy. I took a self-defense class that said be aware and I was so proud of myself, but then I left my hotel room and went down and buried myself in the back of my SUV, putting in my luggage, and I from my eyes saw somebody approach me. What could I have done to make that less scary? So Cindy, that's a that's a great point. So Cindy asked when she went into her vehicle and she was in it deep. You could be putting groceries in your vehicle. You could be putting children into your vehicle. Filling up with gas. Filling up with gas. Same thing. Well, filling up with gas is a little bit different because we don't have to be stuck next to that pump as long as we don't have to hold it. So let, then I'll, I'll address that in just a moment, Jeff. But Cindy's question was, how can we be aware? How about we put some things in, pull ourselves out, look around, see what's going on. And if we have our children with us and they're older, what can they do? Here, here. Spotter. They can be your spotters. They can tell you what's going on. And, and the key, and Jeff, does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. And, and then Jeff's point, when we're pumping gas, what do we do when we're pumping gas? How many people just stand there like this? I'm or, or like this, or doing nothing? I either put my back, if, if this wall were the gas pump, mm -hmm. now I'll stand like this, but I'll tell you one of the best places to stand is at the back of your vehicle. Because what's here? A hose, right? Yeah. That's not an escape route. That's only an yeah. escape route. Keep, keep that in mind. Another thing that you can do, Jeff, is lock the door to your vehicle. Yes. Because you ladies a lot of times leave, leave what in your rig? Purse. Your purse. Yeah. Your purse. Yeah. Your purse. You don't want it stolen. 
So does that answer your question, Jeff? Great. Uh, Mr. So help me understand what I'm doing wrong, because <laughs> I want to go back a little bit. It doesn't matter what city I'm in, walking down the sidewalk, they always come up to me and want to ask me for money. So I must be doing something that is... Attractive. Yeah, what, what am I doing? So David, so, so David if, if I understand your question correctly, or John, I'm sorry. That's all right. John, if I understand your question correctly, it's what am I doing wrong? Because I seem because to attract those, to attract those people on the sidewalk that are trying to spot out-of-towners. And that's the thing. They know you're an out-of-towner. It looks like money. Yeah, you do. Oh, it looks like money. So what, what? So John, John makes a great point. John makes a great point. My mentor, Dr. April, said this. And we talked about looking people in the eye, right? He would just look people in the eye, panhandlers, and he would do this. He just, he didn't, he didn't embarrass them. He didn't do anything. He just looked them in the eye and they, and they go back and sit down and take their cardboard, whatever it was they had. Yeah. And you probably dressed just like you're dressed right now, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. You don't fit in. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> you look like you're, you look like money. Like Maurice said, you look like money and they want money. Just look, you could look them in the eye and just shake your head. Does everybody have a sense of humor? Thank you. Yes. No, I like that. Does everybody have Thank a sense you. of humor? Yeah. Okay. I'll get you just a moment, right. please. Okay, so you're walking, men, this is a man walking down the street, sees a really, really attractive woman walking this way, and what's he supposed to do? Cross the street. <laughs> right? That wasn't funny. They don't know what? They're supposed to cross the street? Yeah, men cross the street. They do? No. It was a joke. Oh. <laughs> it felt flat. <laughs> Maurice got it. <laughs> Maurice. So, had to be there. so just the opposite of John, what I do is uh, I, give, I give my Southwest Airlines snarl to people. <laughs> What's that? Let's see that. Southwest Let's see Airlines. Here's my Southwest Airlines. Airlines. Let's see that. So when I sit down on the plane on Southwest Airlines, oh. to keep somebody from sitting by me, uh. I, I sit in my seat, and, and when they're coming down the aisle, I, I look at them like this. <laughs> and I say, don't you dare sit by me. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> yeah, yes. <laughs> I, want to, I want the seat next to me to be empty. I know. Love it. I didn't realize anybody flew Southwest anymore now. <laughs> they can't. <laughs> so, so conversely, when I'm walking down the street, nobody asked me for money. And so, actually, more, more for you, John, I would encourage you to carry yourself like you know where you're going. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Keep going. Mm -hmm. Carry yourself. Curious, look at how you're carrying yourself. Look in a mirror. Yeah. See? Do you, do you look like you're easy prey to give away money or you're tough to catch up with? Hey, excuse me, sir. Can I get that? Now, one of our, one of the, well, not one, the founder of modern-day pistol craft in the United States of America was Colonel Jeff Cooper. He brought the, he was, a, he was a Marine Corps colonel, he brought the color codes of awareness to the general population of America that the Marine Corps used in the Pacific Theater in World War II. And they are, they are the color codes of awareness. And what might you think those colors may actually be? Warning signs. What are the actual colors, though? Those Levels, oh, the same white, as the yellow, line. orange, red. Jeff, white, yellow, orange, or red. These are the color codes of awareness. Now, white is unaware. You're unaware of what's going on around you. Now, you notice that Sarah has earbuds in, in public. Aside from touching, it's really our, aside, and smell, but we don't typically smell stuff because we're humans. We don't have that sense of smell that dogs have. But we're, we're, we're stopping our 360 degree sense of what's going on around us, aside from touching. If somebody's touching us, that's bad, right? They're in, they're in contact distance. We are unaware of what's going on around us. We fail to recognize those, those aggressive facial expressions and body language that are happening around us. And if we fail to recognize those, 
It's not a good thing. Now I want you to think about this. Think about when you've been in a restaurant and you've seen a couple having words. You may not hear the words, because when you're talking like this, right? To each other. But you can recognize the facial expressions and body language of all that. Can't you? We can. You may not have ever heard the statistic of 55, 38, 7. Cammie has, thank you Cammie, 55% of all human communication comes through facial expressions and body language. 38% through voice quality, tone of voice. Your tone, it's all wrong. And only 7% of the written or the spoken word is how we communicate. Now we know why we get really upset with a text message. Because, and now we have emojis, so that helps us a little bit, right? Smiley face. But how many times have you read a text message and gotten really upset at someone? Or an email, or a letter, because there's no voice inflection. Now we can get them on the phone and we've added 38%. And a lot of times we transact business face to face because we get 55%. That's more than half of our communication. And this is really good for us to determine if we know, like, and trust someone. Because if the words and the body language are not congruent, which one do you actually listen to? The body language. Humans, unless they're really good at it, humans have a hard time forcing their body to actually lie. It's, it's very difficult. An example of that would be if I'm having a conversation with, with Jim and, I'm, and my feet are like this, what am I wanting to do? Leave. I'm wanting to leave. The door's over here. I'll be saying, hey, Jim, this is great. So what are your questions? Great. Thank you.